My name is Cahal Garvey, and I have made it my mission for the last and next few years at least to bring biotechnology, which is traditionally considered something done in cloistered academic or industrial labs, into the house, into the home. Because I feel that that's the ultimate destination for biotechnology in the same way that it was for computers. Now, most of the people in this room, okay, forget that, everyone in this room has in some way benefited from biotechnology. Everyone has, at birth or since then, probably received a genetic test, such as the heel prick test. Apologies for the quick bloodshot. But, um, probably everyone in this room is wearing at least one item of genetically modified cotton, which requires fewer chemical input into the soil, less pesticides, and is better for the environment. But it makes no difference to you, I'm afraid. Um, everyone knows somebody whose life has either been improved or saved outright by drugs derived from genetically modified organisms, such as human insulin, interferon, or any number of monoclonal antibodies. An increasing number of people around the world are directly eating genetically modified foods and still suffer no ill effect. We're not allowed to grow genetically modified foods in Europe, so we don't directly eat them, but almost all of our cattle are fed genetically modified corn and, again, feel no ill effect. And Many people in this room, myself included, have received the hepatitis B vaccine, which is, again, a genetically modified organism, which avoids all of the risks involved in the live vaccine with none of the drawbacks of reduction in efficiency. Probably nobody has any genetically modified pets yet, but they're growing in popularity in the US, like these genetically modified zebrafish, which are fluorescent under a blue or UV lamp. That's all they do. <laughs> now, why do I think this is leaving uh, the academic lab? Why do I think it's coming home? Well, there is a move from what has been called genetic engineering or genetic modification and all of these nice prosaic terms to what's been in a, much, in, in, in a media disaster renamed synthetic biology, which sounds very threatening. Now, there are a lot of trends that are causing this shift and making it easier for people in labs to do genetic, in, genetic work, genetic research, I should say, as well, um, but also making it possible for it to be taken outside of the lab and done by people possibly with no academic training. Now, one of the groups who are leading this are uh, computer scientists who have brought you know, an engineering approach to biology. This is a petri dish containing the first E. coli engineered to behave like a photographic film. And they're saying, hello world, the first thing that a computer programmer generally learns to get his computer to do. A lot of people are also bringing their skills in hardware to make the expensive equipment we normally require to do genetic work more accessible, easier to use, and most importantly, cheaper. Between the open PCR and Pearl Biotech gel rig here, you can get the, the equipment necessary to do a simple genetic test at home for a fraction of the cost of traditional uh, industrial equipment, and it'll probably last longer. The most important single thing leading the shift towards what's termed synthetic biology is, of course, the synthesis of DNA from scratch. It used to be that if you wanted to make a fluorescent thing, like those fluorescent glowfish, you had to go and find something fluorescent physically, get the DNA from it, and then put that in. Or beg, borrow, or steal from someone who's already done so. But now you can literally order the DNA online. And in tandem with this is a collapsing cost in DNA se sequencing, which allows us to read our own DNA and the DNA of everything else in nature, and see how does it work, so that we can then feed that back in. These are the so-called Carlson curves, which show, versus the famous Moore's law, how rapidly productivity is increasing in DNA synthesis and sequencing. Now, what would people actually do if they bring this home? A lot of people actually immediately pursue pure science. So, studying the world around them, doing genetic tests on the things in the back garden. Let's try and identify ladybirds from one another without having to remember how many spots each species has. Or studying your own DNA to do medical genetics on yourself. And this is really valuable personally, but can also feed into really valuable science. Other people take the engineering route, and in fact, most people who come to you know, the, the, the hobby area of biotech and ask, what, what'll I do? We say, okay, why don't you go and replicate this uh, remarkable experiment where you take DNA from the Aquaria Victoria jellyfish, which is mildly bioluminescent, and put the green fluorescent protein gene into E. coli. And you get these nice fluorescent E. coli. If you have enough colors, you can even paint with them. Now, one of the things, though, that is really feeding into this culturally, and I think that that's a very important thing to explore, is the maker culture and how the distributed manufacturing trend, which some of you may have uh, encountered out in the lobby with the 3D printers there, is making lab work easier to do, but is also shaping the way that people in the lab think about their work. This is a rep wrap, and a couple of years ago, I had a derivative of a rep wrap called a MakerBot cupcake. And after learning how to use it and making a, making a few fun toys and things around the house with them, Christmas ornaments. Um, at the time, I was setting up a lab. And one of the pieces of equipment that I couldn't quite you know, afford to ship to Ireland, given the amount of metal, was a centrifuge. For those who aren't up to speed on centrifuges, 
In a lab, you will often need to separate things by density. And one of the easy ways to do this is strap your samples to opposite sides of a wide rotor and spin them extraordinarily fast. The heavy stuff goes to the ends, the light stuff stays in the liquid. Easy. Without this, you're very, very limited. But it's very simple in concept. So why not print one? So I was able to design a piece of plastic, which I call the Dremelfuge in my favorite modeling suite, OpenSCAD. And I was able to then print that out and upload the model online, because I believe strongly in the ability of other people to benefit from, what, from my work and vice versa. So I put this online under a free Libre open source license and said, here, do whatever you want with it. And I was surprised at just how many people actually liked this. This is a fresh print, including a Dremel Fusion, some other thing I made, not printed by me, which is kind of heartening. Someone else saw what I was doing and said, hey, this is cool. I think I'll print it. You can take that straight off the print platform, test it for fit. You can see those two tubes strapped in either end of the uh, Dremel Fuge. They have to be opposite one another, or they'll probably fly off and take your eye out. And you can then strap this onto as threatening a power tool as you can find locally. <laughs> and spin it as fast as possible with samples inside to separate cells, DNA, protein, all those things that you're used to hearing cause zombies or, you know, what have you. I'm not the only person doing this. This is the Smashotron 3000 from Russell Niches. And the Smashotron is a cell, lyse, a cell lyser, a, a, a cell disruptor for breaking open cells and getting bits out. And you attach it to a hammer action drill, put your cells inside and shake them to death. This is a micropipette from Conrad Wallace which can be used to handle very small and precise volumes of liquid, which is essential as well in a lab. This is a 3D printable microscope, which uses optics taken from a disposable camera. And turning this all on its head and having, rather, the, rather than the printer making lab equipment, how about the printer has lab equipment? This is a bioprinter produced by the BioCurious collective of uh, you know, biohackers in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it can actually print cells, protein, uh, or gel in a very precise matrix. It's predicted that someday bioprinters could print organs, but they did this for fun and had remarkably good results. There is a certain ethic that comes with the maker movement, and this is why I think it's so important that we have DIY biotechnology appearing and feeding into labs, and then the labs absorbing that culture. The Repra Foundation, who started the 3D printing revolution in earnest when the patents finally ran out, um, name all of their printers after famous geneticists, and their first one was called the Darwin. This is a picture of the first occasion of the Darwin self-replicating. And they are doing this explicitly to copy the innate behaviors of life. They want something that you can give one of these to a village somewhere, your, your archetypical village. And when you come back next year, everyone's got one. Now, they have a problem. You can 3D print most of the parts of a 3D printer, except the electronics, the motors, and a few other key structural elements. And they are working on this, and they are mimicking life. But I posit that in the next few years, we will actually see the reverse sort of thing happening, where life starts to follow the same trend as distributed manufacturing, where we all gain the ability, rather than programming and building robots and getting those to make things for our lab, we get our lab to make things for everywhere else. Or kitchen, but why bother calling it a lab when it's at home? Now, life has these amazing traits. We're all familiar with some of them, but just to hammer through, in contrast to electronics, which often require very rare elements, life uses a very, very small set of extremely common elements. We wouldn't get very far if we required something rare. And four out of these elements, which are considered the most essential, are in the air you're breathing. The other two are in every rock or piece of soil outside. And life can do some pretty stunning stuff with this. The reason I'm still standing here today is as a result of this biosynthetic path, which requires only four proteins and produces caffeine. Now, we all love caffeine. Life can also do some really intricate and amazing work with structure. This is a 555 timer zoomed in on an electron micrograph. It's a small piece of integrated chip technology, which is used to make a timer. Electronics enthusiasts worldwide love these things. And this is a single scale from a butterfly leaf. Butterflies do not have green or blue dyes. They use a complex nanostructure on their leaf to fuse light in order to make it appear a higher frequency than it really is. And this incredible structural capacity of biology is going to be critical in creating the next wave of nanotechnology. And we don't have to fight for self-replication because that's, by definition, what biology does. You know, we, we have dogs. Now we have many dogs. Where will we put them? <laughs> Best yet, most of the tools below a certain scale that we use to manipulate DNA, to manipulate the stuff of life, are produced by life themselves. 
This is EcoWare 1, a common lab enzyme which is produced by E. coli and has been used for decades to manipulate the DNA of E. coli and other species to understand how they work, and more recently to manipulate that DNA to make new stuff. And you can brew that at home with the right process. Okay, how about leaving, you know, stop being so recursive? This is PLA, polylactic acid. And polylactic acid is one of the two feedstocks which is used for 3D printers. And in fact, I just had a Dremelfuge printed courtesy of 3D printing Dave outside in polylactic acid. Polylactic acid is produced from agricultural produce at the moment, but it can be directly biosynthesized. So, what if you had a little house plant that produces little strings of plastic that you feed straight into the printer someday? It's conceivable. But how will this enter Ireland? How are you most likely to see this first? I think, although genetically modified crops have a bad reputation because of the vast monopolies and uh, profiteering that are done using them, that's not the technology itself, it's just the, you know, the precursors, the people using it at the moment. And, but Ireland has a really strong grow-your-own movement. And I think that we'd be interested in this when we start to see how, taking, taking out the agro-biotech angle, what would I do if my crops could be different or better in some way? I already buy loads of seeds from local Irish companies, which are really genetically diverse. I love to read up on them. I love to plant them in my back garden and harvest them and see what they do. And there's an amazing pharmacopoeia in nature, but sometimes I just can't grow something in my soil. That could be because of the potato blight. And Chagusk are working on a potato that is, for example, naturally resistant to the Irish potato, well, not the Irish potato blight, it's a global problem, we just kind of captured it. Um, but, you know, the, the potato blight, it doesn't actually affect wild potato that much. But it evolves far faster than we can ever breed a, re a normal agricultural potato. We're never going to win that battle without genetics. And they're creating a patent-free, non-commercial potato that's naturally resistant. I showed you this slide earlier. This is golden rice. Note the gold color. Golden rice is a project to create rice that has vitamin A in the, in the actual seed itself, which is normally the only part of the rice plant not to contain vitamin A. And millions of people around the world who rely on rice as a staple crop are feeling the negative consequences of this as they face blindness and possibly death. This is not quite a patent-free project, I'm afraid, but it is an attempt to make a humanitarian outreach and say, we're not going to sue you if you're just using it for your own use. I wish it could be a bit better than that, but still. Now, selfishly, what would I do? Coffee is likely to spike in price in the next 10 or 20 years for a variety of ecological, economic reasons. And every time this happens, like wars or you know, agricultural collapses or whatever, we tend to turn to local alternatives to coffee, which vary in their terribleness. These are <laughs> dandelion roots. And they're not actually that terrible. It's convincingly like coffee, but it's missing one key ingredient, which I've already introduced, and that's caffeine. But as I've already mentioned, that's only four enzymes away. I could already do that today. I could go online and order those enzymes and bang them into dandelion and probably get sued for doing so. <laughs> what will we wear in this biotech future where hopefully it all belongs to us and we get to do what we like? This is a spider silk cape. It's not a very impressive cape, but spider silk can actually be bulletproof. It has phenomenal tensile strength because it's supposed to catch these bullet-like insects and also catch falling spiders. But it's impossible to milk spiders economically. We're never going to have spider silk coats naturally. But I want one. <laughs> I want to be bulletproof. There are already, believe it or not, spider goats. Despite their name, they don't behave in any way differently to a regular goat. But their milk contains spider protein. Lamely enough, they can't even use it to jet between buildings, but maybe we could train them or something. <laughs> Spider goats, you can extract the protein and make something out of, but the, a more practical approach is to use silkworms engineered to produce spider silk instead, and this has already been done. And that means that we can use existing industrial processes, often at the ground level, where people are growing these as cottage industries, which is where I really want to see biotech going. And they can produce an extremely valuable substance which has applications in aeronautics and aerospace, medicine, and having bulletproof shirts. But there's one big barrier that I don't ever want to give a talk without mentioning, and it's critical. One of them is, most people are afraid of biotech, and they don't need to be. It's already, you're already wearing it, for the love of goodness. So, like, I would love to see people going home and learning about this, preferably by doing it, and then, if they like it, advocating for its use, and if they don't, arguing on its merits. But one of the big challenges that we will all face, regardless of our outlook, is patents. And that is the reason why every genetically modified organism we've seen to date has been produced for, for profit, more or less, with the exception of a few state-backed things like the uh, light-resistant potato and light golden rice. It's only a profit motive that allows people to take part. And we need to say we won't accept patents, and that we want the bounty of nature to be a commons, as it was always supposed to be. 
Now, in my last few seconds, I'd like to thank the people whose images made this talk possible. <laughs> I'd like to thank the organizers and thank you all for your patience.